I am so excited that we're going to be having on-site worship services again soon. If you haven't heard, we are going to be opening back up for on-site services. People can come to the campus for the service on June 14th. You can watch a video that details how we're going to be doing this below. You'll want to make sure to watch that if you haven't seen it yet. And also know that we will be continuing to live stream our services, uh, which will actually start being at 9 o'clock instead of 9.30 on, on June 14th. One of the things that we cannot help but notice in these days, especially as we're starting to get back together again, is that we all have different opinions about everything, don't we? We have different opinions about COVID-19 and how we should respond. Some say wear masks. Some say don't wear masks. Some say lock down. Some say open everything back up right away. We have varying opinions on the current political climate. We have varying opinions on the racial situation in our country and what ought to be done in these areas. We have different opinions even on how Jesus would have us respond to these times. And so one of the things that I notice when I look at the early church in the book of Acts is that they were unified, uniquely unified. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, it says that they had everything in common. In Acts chapter 4, verse 32, it says, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul. And they received, and then they received dire warnings for, uh, against division uh, throughout the, the New Testament. In John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus famously says, This is how they will know you are my disciples, by your love for one another. Well, if it's true that they'll know your Christians, your legitimate, credible Christians by your love for one another, then the opposite is also true. They're going to be driven away, see Christianity as uncredible if they see our silly divisions. Paul spends much of his writings preaching against silly divisions. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul gives a list of what he calls the works of the flesh. Listen to this list. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Paul says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So the big question then is how? How did they do it in Acts? I mean, surely they had differing opinions. We know they did. We read about it. We read about them in the New Testament. And how are we supposed to maintain unity today with all the different opinions all the different passionate opinions that we have amongst our people. Well, there's a lot we could say about this, but I think the best place to start is with the words of Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. So I just want to take the rest of our time here and read through these verses and make a few comments. Paul says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Does any of that describe you? He says, if any of this is true of you, complete my joy by being of, listen, the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Paul says that if you have any encouragement of Christ, if you have the Holy Spirit in you at all, if you're comforted by the love of God, fight for unity. And then he tells us how in verse 3. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. In other words, examine your motives constantly, especially if you're about to disagree with someone. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Right? You'd be most concerned for the interest of others. How often can that be said of you and I? Verse 5. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. What that really means is think like Jesus thought. And then Paul's going to tell us how Jesus thought. And this is profound. I love this verse. Verse 6. Who, though he was in the form of God, Jesus was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. How often do you and I uh, kind of take the attitude of, do you know who I am? You know, do you know, uh, don't mess with my rights, right? Jesus was God himself. And he chose not to use that status as a thing to be grasped as to a thing as a thing for his own advancement. He disciplined himself for 33 years not to exercise the power of God. Verse 7, instead he emptied himself. How did he empty himself? By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He became one of us. In verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. 
Jesus emptied himself by denying his God power and coming to us, right? I'm reminded of, of Jesus making the statement that he came to serve us, not to be served. That's amazing. God himself comes down to earth to serve us, not to be served by us. This is the kind of mind that we're supposed to have. Jesus emptied himself by denying his God power, coming amongst us, becoming our servant, humbling himself, forsaking his rights, his power, his very life to save us. Now listen, this doesn't mean you cannot voice your opinion or even have healthy disagreements. It does not mean that, uh, that we uh, can't, that we all have to believe the same things about everything. But what it does mean is that we all care most about Jesus Christ and his agenda. And this allows us to begin to see mountains from the molehills. It allows us to let things go. It allows us to empathize and to hear the other person and, and give people the benefit of the doubt in the church. And it allows us to love each other and work together in spite of our differing opinions. We'll see you Sunday.